So I want to start with a question for you. Have you ever experienced um, a moment, maybe it's on a, on a beautiful walk, maybe it's actually here on a Sunday morning, maybe it's listening to a piece of music or watching uh, a great movie, but have you ever had a moment when it just seems as though, uh, just for a few seconds, things somehow kind of seem to like line up and lock into place? Uh, there's this fleeting moment of kind of perfect symmetry of beauty and joy, your heart swells, It's like things are exactly as they should be, and then it's gone. Have you ever had those moments? I have those once in a while, um, and I I love them so much. Often it is here when we're worshiping together, but often it's when when I go on a walk. Ever since we moved to BC here 14 years ago, I I love going for walks, and so I'll I'll have my dog Sully, and I'll put my my headphones on, and I'll listen to Max Richter or Oliver Arnold, who are great composers, and and I'll be walking. The air is beautiful, and I'm noticing, like, new colors on the leaves, especially these days, and it's like suddenly this moment comes, and and it's like, yeah, my heart just kind of swells up, and it's like, man, this this is exactly how it's supposed to, and then it's gone, (laughs) and I'm like, ah, I knew it. It's like I'm trying to hang on to it. It's slippery, and it's fleeting, but we have these moments, and I used to kind of feel really, I mean, I still feel sad about it when, when it leaves, but it's almost like now when it happens, I'm like, okay, Corey, enjoy this moment because it's going to be gone in a second. I think that I have come to realize that maybe these moments are, are prophetic for us in a way. Maybe they're actually moments where I'm experiencing just a touch of what eternity with God is going to be like. Whereas Julian of Norwich, a saint from the past, exclaimed, all shall be well and all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. So Celtic Christians, they would say that when we experience those moments, we're actually experiencing what they would call a thin place. Thin places, they would say, are those moments or places in our world where the veil between heaven and earth, between God and us, where that veil is just a little bit thinner. And we have these moments of experiencing what heaven might be like, what God's presence is fully like, unfiltered, just for a moment. And so I believe that actually in these moments, we are somehow experiencing something of the holiness of God. If you're new this week, I want to let you know that we are in a series uh, on prayer. And uh, we have been basing it on the Lord's Prayer, which is the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray in Matthew 6. And this is our third week uh, in that series. Uh, Our first week, we talked about the phrase, uh, find a quiet place, keep it simple, keep it honest, keep it going. We explored the idea that prayer is all about simplicity and honesty, and that it's actually built on relationship. And last week, Matthew started in on the Lord's Prayer, which we're going to explore line by line over the next couple of weeks, next number of weeks. And he started with that phrase, the first phrase in the prayer, our Father in heaven. And we looked at who is it that we're praying to when we pray? What is God like? And actually, what what we learned last week is that if we ever want to know what God is like, we just need to look at Jesus. We're told over and over again in the New Testament that Jesus is what God looks like. He's the visible image of the invisible God. He's Emmanuel, God with us. And this week, I'm going to be focusing on this next phrase, which is, hallowed be your name. And so we're going to be looking at worship as prayer today. So let's begin by praying the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen. So what does it mean to pray, hallowed be your name? What's all involved in living with this kind of posture? Well, the word hallowed actually comes from the Greek adjective hagios, and it means to be set apart, different than. Something that is hagios is unique, it's set apart from other things. And so we could actually translate this phrase to mean, let your name, O God, be treated differently than other names. Let God's name be given a position which is absolutely unique and set apart. And there's an element to holiness to it as well. In fact, this is often how it's translated, holy is your name. And this phrase is describing not only the fact that God is set apart, but it's also describing something of the character of God. It's like saying, again, God, you are set apart from us. You are so far above and beyond us. Your name is holy. You are holy. You are above all other things. And so this morning, we're going to explore a little bit more about what it means to pray and experience this hallowedness, this holiness of God. 
Okay, but back to the thin places. So when we experience these moments where things just seem to kind of lock up and to be as they should be just for those moments, it could be that we are experiencing confirmation of what the writer of Ecclesiastes talks about when he writes that God has set eternity on the human heart. It's one of my favorite passages in all of scripture. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says that God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Eternity on the human heart. It's this idea that God has somehow hardwired us for himself. There's something in us that is always reaching out for the divine, as though we know we're made for more. It's this eternal ache that we all have. Blaise Pascal talked a bit about this when he said, what else does this craving and this helplessness proclaim but that there was once in man a true happiness of which all that now remains is the empty print and trace. This he tries in vain to fill with everything around him, though none can help, since this infinite abyss can be filled only with an infinite and immutable object, in other words, by God himself. We're told in the beginning of Genesis that God made us in his image. Somehow we have a bit of God within us. We resemble our creator and these moments, I really do believe that they move us towards God and that they can move us towards having a heart of prayerful worship. For me, they're often quite worshipful experiences where I find myself feeling just really grateful for life and for the beauty of this world that God has made. I'm actually often drawn into just giving thanks to God, offering in that moment in my own small way my worship to God. You ever had that feeling of of thankfulness when you can't necessarily articulate what it is exactly that you're thankful for? Fun little side note, uh, British theologian and author G.K. Chesterton once remarked that the worst moment for an atheist is when he is really thankful and has no one to thank. (laughs) It's true. So I want to suggest today that you and I are made for worship. I should point out that the word worship isn't necessarily a Christian word, actually. We're all worshipers, and I don't mean everyone here in this room, I mean all of us. We are all hungry for more, we're all searching and reaching for the divine, I believe. We all ascribe an ultimate worth to something or other. I really love what James K.A. Smith writes in his book, You Are What You Love, which is a fantastic book. He says that to be human is to be a liturgical animal a creature whose loves are shaped by our worship. And he goes on to quote the writer uh, David Foster Wallace, who isn't a Christian, by the way, uh, who says this in a commencement address that he gave a few years ago. He says, there's no such thing as atheism. There's no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And then he goes on to describe the perils of wrong worship. He says, if you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you'll never have enough. If you worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure, you'll always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally plant you. Worship power, you will feel weak and afraid. You'll need ever more power over others to keep that fear at bay. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, you'll end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. The insidious thing about these forms of worship is not that they're evil or sinful, it's that they're unconscious. They're default settings. They're the kind of worship you just gradually slip into day after day, getting more and more selective about what you see and how you measure value without ever being fully aware that that's what you're doing. It's interesting. Wallace wouldn't call himself a Christian and yet he's recognizing that we all have this default setting within us, this God-shaped hole, this eternity on our hearts. And when I think about this idea of God placing eternity on our hearts, I can understand, I think, where creativity comes from. Why we're always searching desperately for more purpose and meaning in life. Why our artists are always describing things that they're feeling and sensing, but they haven't actually seen or can't quite articulate. Sadly, I also really believe that this, ironically, is also where so much of our addictions and our anxieties and our depression comes from. We are, we're, we're trying to fill this void with things that were never meant to fill it. Again, as Pascal said, God himself is all that can truly fill this hole in our hearts. Chesterton is attributed as well to have said that every man that knocks on the door of a brothel is looking for God. 
So how do, we, um, how do we fill that void in a healthy way? How do we make sure that we're not filling it with unhealthy things? How do we avoid becoming worshipers of false gods that will betray us? Whatever these small g gods might look like to you, money, power, alcohol, stuff, how we're seen, our image, etc. I think that the answer to that is we need to learn to love God. We need to learn what it means to pray, hallowed be your name, and what it means to live out of that prayer. In Mark chapter 12, a religious teacher asked Jesus, what's the most important commandment? And Jesus responded by saying that the most important commandment is that you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I think it's worth asking, what does that look like? How do we actually love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength? I want to suggest that I think a big part of it has everything to do with enjoying God, delighting in Him, delighting in who He is and who He has made us to be. As Saint Irenaeus exclaimed, the glory of God is a man fully alive. To love God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength is to live in a way that is actually fully human. We'll just wait, just joking. Uh, it, is for me, uh, it is for me to be living fully as Corey, the way God intended Corey to live. Flourishing, thriving, being a blessing to people around him and to the world, reflecting the beauty and the image of his heavenly father as he loves people and as he cares for what God has made, delighting in who God is and who God made him to be. It's actually living a life as prayer towards God because again, we are made to worship. And so much of this has to be learned. How? Well, let's go back to the Lord's Prayer for a second. Uh, the order of the Lord's Prayer is significant. The prayer doesn't say, our Father in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. No, instead it actually begins by acknowledging God's holiness, his set-apartness. Again, it's like saying, God, you alone are holy. You are the one who is set apart from us and from all other things. You are beautiful and majestic. You're full of grace and mercy and kindness. You are the only one who can actually grant what we're about to ask. Only when we give God his place will other things take their proper place. This is foundational to our lives. When we build our lives upon this rock, everything else tends to fall into place. We see this all through the Old Testament and the Bible. The nation of Israel, who is God's set apart, chosen people, they always go wrong without exception when their praise goes wrong when they begin to praise the wrong things. And so what is of highest value to you? Everything else will follow from that and your life will be organized accordingly. The Christian argument is that if our highest value is something other than God, we will struggle and will flail in life. God has made us for himself. He has made us to worship. Well, that's great, Corey, but how do we actually do that? How do we actually live a life that is postured in this worshipful, prayerful position? And the answer, I think, is uh, we practice. We practice, we form good habits. So it's one thing for me to say, uh, you know, I would like to be a great hockey player. I wanna be a good hockey player, but to be honest, I don't wanna put a ton of work into it. I just like to be a great hockey player. Well, anyone who plays hockey right away would be like, yeah, that's probably not gonna happen. You're gonna have to put a lot of hard work in. Or maybe, and I see this all the time, it might be, uh, you know, you have the, the advertisements where it's like, you too could be a fantastic piano player in just three weeks if you download this course on YouTube. And, you know, and everyone who, again, has played the piano or is a musician knows, it's like, that's probably not gonna actually happen. We know it's not true. The answer, of course, it has everything to do with discipline, good habits and practice, immersing myself in the game of hockey or in music for a long time, practicing even when I don't feel like it, learning to know the game, learning to know music well. And so we need to practice our worship. We need to practice our prayer. We need to practice loving God. Again, James K.A. Smith says this, the reminder for us is this, if the heart is like a compass, an erotic homing device, then we need to regularly calibrate our hearts tuning them to be directed to the Creator, our magnetic north. It's crucial for us to recognize that our ultimate loves, longings, desires, and cravings are learned. He argues that we learn to love not so much by acquiring information, 
but rather by practicing habits that direct our affections. We've probably all heard that term before, uh, practice makes permanent. It's very true. Again, if I want to become a great hockey player or musician, uh, you know, reading a whole bunch of books about hockey or about piano playing or about music, you know, it might help a little bit, but it's certainly not the entire answer. And we can practice poorly if we're not careful. We need to practice correctly. So, again, as a, I used to teach piano quite a bit, and, and I would see it all the time. I would say, like, make sure you're practicing that, that one quick line with the right fingering. Like, You've got to have the right finger, you know, and we, because you will learn. You will learn what you're practicing. Like, you will learn. So, next week's like, oh, my word, okay, again, like, no, you have, you got to use a three there. You can't use a four there. It's going to mess you up. But, you know, inevitably, you know, this, uh, this, this kid, you know, he's, uh, sorry, I'm reliving all this uh, frustration. Um, <laughs> you know, you see it, right? It happens, and, and it betrays you in the end. You get betrayed in the end because you've been practicing the wrong things, and we do practice, we do learn what we practice. Practice makes permanent. So the bottom line here is we don't just think our way into right worship. It takes practice. And again, we need to be aware this is for good and for ill. The things that we practice, we become quite good at. When we're practicing things that are damaging to us, you know, over a long period of time, it becomes harder and harder for us to move out of that rut. We could probably all, at least in our hearts, shake our head to that, nod to that, right? It's true. And so, by the way, this is one of the things that we do here at North Langley Community Church week after week. It's actually important to come to church. And it's funny how that all comes around. I used to roll my eyes at that. It's like, go to church, yeah, 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 I know it's the right thing to do. But now, I actually really do believe that we should go to church because it is the right thing to do. It's for my own benefit, it's the right thing to do because practice makes permanent. I love what Matthew said a couple of weeks ago when he talked about uh, this dance between duty and delight when it comes to worshiping God. This idea that sometimes, yes, worshiping God, living in a way that honors him, practicing the presence of God, practicing loving God, sometimes it's going to feel like a duty. And that's okay. I think that we often think of that word duty as though it's a bad thing, but it really isn't, or it doesn't have to be. Like if you're a doctor and you're having a bad day and you really don't feel like doing that heart surgery, guess what? It's probably a good thing for you to do the heart surgery. If you're an engineer during, doing the final inspections on a bridge that millions of people are going to be driving over and you're just not feeling it that day, guess what? It's probably a good thing for you to do it anyway. And maybe not such an extreme example. If you're a teacher whose role it is to help kids learn and grow and you're not feeling it, it's still just a really good and beneficial thing to do, even if your heart may not exactly be in it that day. If we believe that it's a good thing for us to honor God in our lives for this world around us to flourish, if we believe it's a good thing for us to flourish, then it's a good thing for us to practice our love for God, our worship, our prayer towards God, even when we're not feeling it. Here's the beautiful thing. Often, when we do our duty, when we're disciplined in what we know is the right thing, that duty actually often turns into delight. In a sense, we often duty our way into delight. It's true in all sorts of ways. I know for me, for many years, I would feel guilty coming on a Sunday morning and, and leading worship uh, if my heart wasn't in it, because that happens sometimes, right? You show up and it's like, oh, I just had a fight with my wife, or this week has been terrible, or I'm really wrestling with that sin in my life, and I'm just like, oh, you know, how am I supposed to, I'm supposed to be leading people in worship, and, and I think I've come to realize, like, it's, it's okay. It's okay if you're not feeling it, just because don't trust your heart quite that much in those moments. It's okay to do the right thing. Corey, you're going to lead worship. You're going to try to bless people as they bless God. That's the goal. I really love what Pete Grieg uh, says in his book, Teach Us to Pray. He says this, it's an act of the will. Instead of waiting to worship until I feel like it, which could be a very long wait indeed, I begin to thank God for all the evidence of his love in my life, often speaking out loud until my feelings fall into line with the facts. Sometimes it can seem a bit fake at first, but that's okay. And occasionally I continue to feel tired, sad, or lethargic, and that's okay too. If I only said I love you to my wife when I was overwhelmed with passion, I definitely wouldn't tell her often enough. And actually, my love for her may well be more honest, less fake in the cold light on an ordinary day than it is during the hormonal surge of an emotional moment. All right, I have a little smiley face there. <laughs> Getting all romantic, Pete. Uh, he goes on to remind us as well that in Hebrews 13, uh, we're urged to offer God a sacrifice of praise. 
Sometimes, when it's least appealing to offer God our lives, our prayers, our hearts, and we do it anyway, that's when it may, in fact, be the most valuable offering to Him. Just because we're made to worship doesn't mean that we're always going to feel like worshiping. So let's talk a little bit about God's holiness. There is something here that I think we need to wrestle with. I think that that we often lose sight of the fact that God is holy. When we think about God, I think that we can err in at least two uh, extreme kind of polarized ways. On one hand, uh, we can have a really unhealthy fear of God. This idea that, you know, God's out to get us or that we need to clean ourselves up before praying or worshiping. I have a friend who, who doesn't attend church regularly who always jokes around by saying like, man, if I step through the church doors, you know, your church doors, lightning's gonna strike me down. And I'm like, right, that's sort of classic joke, right? This, this idea that he's too sinful to come and be a part of what we're doing. It's clearly not true, right? It's clearly not true about God. Jesus, who again, we're told is the visible image of the invisible God, Jesus always hung out with sinners. In fact, he seemed to actually be drawn to the broken and to the sinful people. We don't need to clean ourselves up before coming to God. God loves us as we are. So on one hand, we can definitely err too far on the side of God being untouchable, distant, too holy and pure to want anything to do with us. However, I think that we can often too easily err on the other side where there just really doesn't seem too much of a difference between Jesus and us. You know, God is just a somewhat irrelevant, kind old grandfather who winks at injustice and sin and smiles a lot. I never really loved those Jesus is my homeboy uh, t-shirts. I'm sorry if you have one or if you're wearing one today, that would be terrible. I'm just kidding, I really do like it. I don't like it, but you know, if I, I do sort of. <laughs> it's like this idea that's like, oh yeah, Jesus is just, he's exactly like us. You know, like he's my pal, he's my drinking buddy, he's someone who just fits right, he totally gets me, you know? And I'm like, yes, Jesus totally gets us, absolutely. He can identify with our weaknesses, we're told, right? He is our faithful friend but I don't think we should make the mistake of thinking that he is exactly like us, in the same boat as us. No, Jesus, he's the one through whom the universe was formed. He's the savior of the world who took upon himself the sins and the brokenness of you and me, of this world, even as he died horrifically, defeating death as he did it, only to rise again after three days, completing his victory, and ensuring us an eternity where death no longer has the final word and where we will be forever with him. So Jesus is our friend and he is holy and set apart from us. Keep in mind that when we pray, hallowed be your name, we should be thinking of Jesus when we think your name. Jesus is God in flesh. He's God among us. It's pretty wild and mysterious, but we have to remember that if we want to know God, we look to Jesus. So we live in the tension sometimes of these two extremes. Either we fear in an unhealthy way uh, God's holiness or On the other hand, we treat his name in an almost cavalier kind of way. I know we talk a lot about C.S. Lewis and the Chronicles of Narnia here, um, but it's just just so good. And so I love the way C.S. Lewis describes Aslan, who is this Christ-like figure in the Chronicles of Narnia. Aslan is this beautiful, powerful, dangerous, gentle, and kind lion. He laughs easily and enjoys being in the presence of his friends, and yet he is set apart and everyone knows it. There's a section in the book where Mr. Beaver is describing to Lucy what Aslan is like. Is he a man, asked Lucy. Aslan a man, said Mr. Beaver sternly. Certainly not. I tell you, he is king of the wood and the son of the great emperor beyond the sea. Don't you know who is the king of the beasts? Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Ooh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, and no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or just silly. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. And so when it comes to worship, we should remind ourselves that God, he's holy, he is hallowed, he's set apart and he's approachable in Jesus. He calls us his friends, he loves us, he has died for us. When we see and experience this kind of holiness, something beautiful often takes place. It often happens again for me when I'm here. The big things going on in my world become just a little bit smaller. Our perspective changes. 
God is on his throne and all will be well, even when things are not well, we're reminded that we serve a strong and faithful God. When we gather together for worship and prayer, here or wherever else, we're reminded again who we are and how God sees us. Even when we show up and we're feeling bruised and battered, depressed with our own sinfulness or embarrassed by our behavior, we are reminded about the fact that we are loved, loved in a way that we actually have trouble fully understanding. The Apostle Paul reminds us of this when he writes that, I'm convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's beautiful. I don't know if you're like me. Sometimes, honestly, I'll be like, we'll be singing together and I get like emotional. There'll be like a line that jumps out at me and I'll be like, oh, and I just have to stop singing. And I'm like, that is like, that is me. That's for me, God, thank you. Like I need, yes, okay, yes, you know? And, and I'm just like, oh, okay, all right, here we go. Especially it sucks when I'm leading worship because I'm like trying to, I'm trying to do a good job of leading, but I'm like, oh my word, like detach, detach. I can't, you know, I'm trying to like figure out how to keep doing this, but not, you know, I don't want to be fake, but I, I want to lead well. And, but it's this prophetic thing that can happen in our times of worship together where God is, is speaking to us and reminding us, you're loved. I know all about it, you're forgiven. And so even when we're worthless and unlovable, we need, to be, we need to be reminded of this. We all need to keep in mind, by the way, that God loves us too much to leave us as we are. That's the beauty of God's action. He cares deeply. He cares deeply about what our lives look like. He's a good father. Of course he's gonna care about what his son or daughter, what they're doing, how their lives are going. Why? Is it, because, is it because he feels embarrassed if they somehow shame the family name? Is it because he's gotta face his friends at work who will know all about what kind of mess his daughter has gotten herself into this time? No, I think we can all see that. That's not a great picture of a good father. No, God hates the thought of us wasting our precious lives, our valuable lives, he hates seeing us living in a way that is damaging to us and to the world around us that he loves so much. And so he works with us, he pursues us, he brings good people and moments into our lives that remind us again who we are and who he is. It's why we exist together, by the way. I need you to remind me who I am and who God is, and you actually need me to do the same thing for you. We need to remember that worship is not only vertical, it's not just a me and God thing, it's actually horizontal in a sense. Again, the Apostle Paul reminds us of this in Ephesians 5 where he writes, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, this is all part of our prayer life. Worship is prayer, and we are made to worship. So speaking to each other with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. In other words, we help each other. We remind each other. It's one of the reasons why community is just so important. One of the big reasons for me personally that I love coming to church is because if I'm totally honest, I really need it. I need to be reminded of who God is, but also who I am. I need to be reminded that I'm loved, that I bear the image of my Creator and that He delights in me. I need to be reminded that my sins are forgiven that I've got a purpose here on earth, that he's calling me to something that is particular to who he has made me to be. Now, I can hear right now um, a quiet sort of like consumer, uh, consumerism objection, right? There's, we hear that a lot sometimes, like, you know, hey, let's just remember like worship and church is not about us, it's about God. It's not about us, it's about God. I think that's a good and healthy uh, check for us, for sure. Like an unhealthy version of that to me looks like, you know, Oh, who's preaching this? Oh, Corey's preaching. Oh, my word. When is Matthew preaching again? This is so, like, okay, I'm heading home. I'll see it. yeah. You know, or it's like, you know, who's leading worship? Oh, why is Corey leading worship again? It's like, you know, so annoying, you know, and I wish Jeff would lead worship more, you know, or whatever. So it's actually not a really healthy picture of our posture, right, when we come to, to the gathered experience of worship. And not just because I'm talking about myself. Uh, it's just not a great, not a great way to look at things. But I do wanna push it a little bit. I would argue that it's, it's true in one sense that we need to be careful. I also think we need to be honest. So when I show up to church again, my goal is definitely I wanna worship Jesus. I wanna learn more about God. I wanna offer him my heart again and I wanna grow with my people. 
You are my people, by the way. But if I'm honest, I'm pretty needy. Like, and in contrast, I know God is not needy. I need him far more than he needs me. When I show up at church, if I'm honest, I really, really do want to experience the presence of God. I want to be reminded that I'm loved by him. I want to know that my sins are forgiven. I want to be reminded of his beauty and his faithfulness. So, in a sense, there is a self-serving side to all of this. Welcome to being a human. And again, obviously, like anything, it can get unhealthy and weird quickly, especially when we start attaching spiritual language to it. No, nah, I just can't connect with Jesus when that guy leads worship. It's like, mm, that's weird. Okay. I remember I had a, I had a uh, when we lived in Ontario, I was leading worship at a church. I'd been asked to lead worship at a, at a church, guest lead. And, and so I was trying to get a band together, and I, I, uh, I called this drummer. And he's like, yeah, I think I can play. And he's like, oh, is, uh, is, is Jacob, and, um, uh, Jacob and Mike playing? And I'm like, no, no, I, don't, I didn't ask. He's like, okay, good, yeah, because those guys hinder my worship. And I'm like, oh, okay, it's weird. Uh, yeah, so, but I think we do need to be honest about the fact that we are needy and we're self-centered kids. Our father is patient, he's kind, and he's generous. I really do believe that if he's a good father, which I believe he is, if he's a better father than I could ever be, then I think that he gets it. I think that he knows I'm a selfish little kid desperate to hear the affirmation of my father, of my dad. Just like when I was, when my kids were younger, uh, you know, and they would bring me a drawing uh, when they were little. You know, I didn't receive, you know, say Ruby comes up to me and she's this little person and she's got this like, this thing that she drew during the day, you know. It's not as though I receive it like, you know, thank you for this, I receive the gift of your offering. Like, <laughs> no, that'd be weird, right? I'm like, oh my word, Ruby, you are a gifted artist. I love it so much. When did you get to be so beautiful, by the way? I think you're awesome. Thank you for giving this to me. I think it's amazing. You know, and again, if I'm honest, I know that this is part of the package for Ruby bringing me a gift, right? She's hoping that I'll love it, and she's probably kind of hoping that she's going to hear some kind words about herself from her dad, whom she loves. And that's a beautiful thing. It's a better way, I think, for us to look at uh, our worship times together. Remember, we are made to worship. And it's a huge part about what it means to be a people of prayer. And by the way, one other beautiful part about worship and prayer is that it's often a thin place. Maybe you've experienced that here as well. Uh, We're getting a small picture of what heaven is going to be like, what it will be like except way better. I love what John Henry Newman, uh, a 19th century English theologian and poet, says. He says, I come then to church because I am an heir of heaven. It's my desire and hope one day to take possession of my inheritance and I come to make myself ready for it. And I would not see heaven yet for I could not bear to see it. I'm allowed to be in it without seeing it that I may learn to see it. And by psalm and sacred song, by confession and by praise, I learn my part. I love that. So, so much of this has to do with delighting in the Lord giving him praise, whether it's on our own or whether it's with our brothers and our sisters. And yes, you know what? We can be honest by saying that sometimes it will be more duty than delight. That's okay. Often it will just bubble to the surface when we're reminded who God is and what he's done and what he's like. You know, we do tend to praise the things that we're excited about, don't we? Again, C.S. Lewis helps us with this when he says, and this is a long quote, but I just thought it's so good I'm going to say it. The most obvious fact about praise, whether of God or anything, strangely escaped me. I thought of it in terms of compliment, approval, or the giving of honor. I had never noticed that all enjoyment spontaneously overflows into praise. The world rings with praise. Lovers praising their mistresses, readers their favorite poet, walkers praising the countryside, players praising their favorite game, Praise of weather, wines, dishes, actors, motors, horses, colleges, countries, historical personages, children, flowers, mountains, rare stamps, rare beetles, even sometimes politicians or scholars. I had not noticed how the humblest and at the same time most balanced and capacious minds praise most, while the cranks, misfits, and malcontents praised the least. I had not noticed either that just as men spontaneously praise whatever they value, so they spontaneously urge us to join them in praising it. Isn't she lovely? Wasn't it glorious? Don't you think that's magnificent? The psalmist, in telling everyone to praise God, are doing what all men do when they speak of what they care about. 
I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. It is its appointed consummation. It's not out of compliment that lovers keep on telling one another how beautiful they are. The delight is incomplete until it is expressed. When we gaze upon the Lord, the longer we look, the more we see and the more we're delighted. It's like looking at a beautiful piece of art. The longer you look, the more you see a new shade of color, some new lines, shadows that you didn't see before. And when someone asks you, hey man, tell me about that painting I heard that you saw that, you know, it's like, we don't just say like, yeah, it was good. No, I hope not. You know, we use our language, our own creativity, our own art to describe what it's like. And by the way, this is why our artists matter so much. They give us words to use. They give us images to embrace, soundtrack to our heart's hunger for God. They teach us about empathy. We need storytellers and poets and songwriters and musicians. Again, we are made to worship. So as we close, uh, I would like to offer just some practical suggestions for us as we pursue what it means to pray and what it means to live out God's hallowedness, his holiness. How do we, how do we live a life of prayerful worship? How do we practice loving God? Well, number one, and maybe this is a little obvious, we, I think it's important to keep coming to church gatherings Sunday after Sunday. I know it feels like something a pastor would say, but I actually honestly believe it. Whether it's here or somewhere else, it really does matter and it really does help shape our hearts and our habits. But don't just come to church, engage in it, be involved, you're part of a family, you're not just a spectator. Remember, I need you and you need me. And by the way, let's just remind ourselves that the church is broken, broken and beautiful, right? It's still the bride of Christ, but let's be honest, there are annoying people here. Just kidding, there's no annoying here. But we know, there are people that are gonna annoy us, we're gonna be, and we're probably gonna be annoying to other people, by the way, just so we're all clear. But it's like family, right? You have family dinner, well, as we all know, family dinners are not always perfect, right? And so, it's still the church, it's still the bride that Jesus loves. Be part of the church, it's important. And of course, what about the not Sunday part of this? Uh, I've got a couple of thoughts as well about that, and it might, again, feel a little bit obvious, but as Matthew said, I think, uh, last week, set aside a chunk of time every day to put yourself in a posture where you can speak to and hear from God. Maybe it's 15 minutes, maybe it's an hour, what's doable? The point is, do something. God will honor that. In that time, spend some time in the scriptures, spend some time in prayer, ask God to speak to you through these things. If you'd like, to, if you'd like some help with that, there are a lot of great apps that are out there that actually can help us decide you know, what that might look like. And so here actually are a couple that I've really enjoyed. So the Bible app, uh, this is a, it's a free app. I've used it a lot. It's got tons of different Bible translations. It's got tons of reading and devotional plans that are both reading the Bible plans and topical plans. It's great. Could be like, you know, anxiety. It's like, boom, here's like a two-week reading plan that walking through the Bible and how, how, can, we, uh, how can we deal with anxiety. Uh, any topic that you want to do, it's got thousands of different plans. Uh, Pray As You Go. Uh, is a fantastic app that is, it's an audio app. It's produced five days per week and one weekend day. I listened to it this morning. Uh, it's a 10 to 13 minute um, session that combines music, scripture, and some reflective questions. And there are fantastic guides with great Irish accents, often, or English, and it's almost always, that's almost always a key part of finding thin places, those kinds of accents, so just kidding. <laughs> Uh, my Daily Office is the third one that I really uh, like as well. It's an app that provides guidance in morning and evening prayers. Um, it's got optional lectionary readings. Uh, it's basically, it's, like a, it's adapted from the Book of Common Prayer. And it's just, there's something about beautiful prayers that have kind of lasted through the centuries. You know, you're praying something that, you know, a Christian maybe, you know, 400 years ago prayed. Something really amazing about that. Because I often find my prayers become shallow, you know, self-centered. I'm like, man, I feel like I'm praying the same thing all the time. It's like, that's why these kinds of prayers, that's sometimes why we, we will often use prayers in our services because there's something rich and beautiful about being like, oh, that's, that's what I wanna pray, that, I need that, that, yes, that is now my prayer, you know? Uh, try praying a psalm. If you can't think of anything else to do, the psalms, it, it's basically a book of prayer. They're filled with humanness. Often they permission us to feel all the feels, whether that's an exuberant, thankful spirit, or whether it's frustration with the way life is turning out, whether it's depression or it's like fear, anxiety, the Psalms are full of everything. And we are permissioned to pray these things to God as we read the Psalm and pray along with them. 
Another one is I've got two that are go for a walk. First one, go for a walk, leave your phone at home, just go for a walk and keep your eyes open to see God's work around you. Feel no pressure, but when something comes to mind, offer it back to God. Remember, God has made everything. He is the giver, the sustainer of all things. The earth is full of his glory. That leaf that has changed color and is the most beautiful shade of red you've ever seen is full of his glory. Think of the words, God, you are, and then finish that sentence. Just spend some time walking, silently offering prayers of adoration to him. Matthew talked a little bit about a good little tool for our, when we pray, like a good order, ACTS, A-C-T-S, right? Which is adoration, confession, thankfulness, and supplication. Supplication is asking God, like, basically, here's what I need, God. Here's what, can you do this for me? Can you help me with this? We start with adoration, just like we talked about today. Another go for your walk, but go for your walk with your phone. But listen to Pray As You Go, the app, or maybe some worship music that you love, or maybe some beautiful instrumental music. Enjoy creation that God has made, and enjoy some beautiful music that God has inspired others to make. Again, no agenda, just offer whatever that is back to God. Avoid the temptation of making these functional experiences. I slip into that all the time. I'll be just listening and like enjoying it, and it's like, oh, I gotta send that email, you know, you know I'll go back and like, I'm, suddenly I'm, I'm just out of the zone and suddenly I'm doing the functional things. It's good for us to just rest and be still in the presence of God. Um, yeah, don't send any, just make it your focus time with God. Finally, I just wanna close with the reminder that you and I were worshipers. The question is, what are we worshiping? What are we pursuing? Remember that God is holy and always start with that and remember that you are loved, you're forgiven, you're welcomed by him. And finally, remember that God, our heavenly father, has made us for himself. When we look at the Lord's prayer and read that we are to pray, hallowed be your name, we're invited to delight ourselves in the Lord, to look upon his beauty and his majesty, his holiness and his goodness, and we're invited to adore him, to give him praise, both in our words and in our gathered times of worship and also in our private lives, in our day-to-day activities. I'm just gonna pray and then we're gonna sing a couple of songs here of worship together. Lord, thank you so much that you have made us for yourself. Uh, Each one of us, God, that uh, again, that the glory, your glory is us fully alive, delighting in you. God, thank you that you know each of us so well. You know the things that we're wrestling with, the things that are bringing us joy. God, thank you that you love us, that you died for each person that is here that you offer your forgiveness and a new way of life. God, we wanna honor you with our lives. We wanna declare that you are set apart from us and yet you are so approachable and so invitational to us. We wanna put our hope and our trust in you. We pray this in Jesus' name.